9 millimeter versus the 45. We've got the biggest pistol caliber debate today on the podcast. Dave and I are going to talk about it right now. Hello, friends and lovers. This is Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Ammunition Guide podcast, brought to you by none other than Ammo.com. Now, Chris, I would no sooner try to talk someone out of carrying a 45 auto than I'd try to convince them to, like, burn down their own house or something. 45 <laughs> fans are diehard. Oh, and they're yeah. not wrong. No, oh, definitely. Nine millimeter, it ain't popular just because it sounds cool and foreign and European. So uh, I'd say... A nine millimeter is the most popular pistol round for self-defense in America, and I would guess 45 is number two, if not number three. It's definitely up there, and uh, just in case you didn't know, if you need some ammo for your carry gun or for some practice time at the range, make sure you click that link down below. Get your free $20 off coupon for ammo.com. Now, I have to agree with you 100%, Dave. Uh, the 45 crowd, boy, they love it. They love their 45s. They'll never give it up, and there's no amount of convincing that you can tell them, like, oh, no, you need to switch to 9 millimeter. But uh, a lot of law enforcement agencies, and I know the FBI, I know our police agency here, have moved back to the 9 millimeter away from the 40. And uh, it is definitely very, very popular for a couple reasons. I, I think, honestly, the first one is magazine capacity. I mean, man, you can really pack those 9mm bullets in the mag. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you never want to count on having good aim when someone's trying to murder you. So that's always a plus. And I think that's the 45's uh, bigger weakness. I mean, that, that tenth of an inch dramatically impacts mag capacity. Oh, definitely, definitely. And I have some examples here. If you watched the intro, you saw me whip out my own. This is my own personal Glock 17. And just so everybody knows ahead of time, all firearms were safety checked before we started the video. They are not loaded. I promised you that. Uh, but uh, the thing with the magazine capacity is honestly the design. Uh, when they started doing, uh, especially Glock, they started doing these double stack magazines where they sit diagonally in the mag so you can pack on that much more. Whereas the more classic 45 design, which is the 1911, uh, which we have right here, uh, uses what's referred to as a single stack mag, where they just sit one on top of each other. But even with a double stack mag in 45, you're losing a lot of rounds. Uh, you know, a Glock 21, which is the, the 45 caliber version, can only hold 13 rounds, where Glock 17 mag can hold 17 rounds in there. Yeah, and a double stock 45 ACP mag, that's, that's going to be uh, pretty pretty thick grip you're gonna to have to have a substantial mitt to handle that as comfortably as you could a double stack nine absolutely no if if you're familiar with with the glock design and things like that the the 45 calibers and the 10 mils uh have a bigger frame and so they are somewhat uncomfortable if you're not used to it now uh they did come out with the sf frame for the short frame which i find a little more comfortable uh if you want to get a 45 caliber glock but yeah they are chunkier uh, it, there's no better way around it. And everybody loves the 45, the 1911 rather, because of these thin grips here. Uh, it really just fits on the hand very nicely uh, and it's very comfortable to carry. But if you want more magazine capacity, you got to upgrade to something bigger like a Glock 21 or a Springfield XD 45, MP 45, something along those lines. And uh, you're going to, you got to have some hands to hold on to that thing. And you got to have a belt to support it. That's a little more handgun. And honestly, yeah. I'm uh, I'm all about the tiny, itty bitty everyday carry. So I'd love to carry a full size 1911, but that's a lot of bulge. It's. I think that's the biggest thing that people don't like to talk about is the ease and comfort of carry. And everybody's like, oh yeah, dude, I'm gonna pack my 1911 around every day. Don't worry about it. It's it's gonna be my EDC. And then after a month, it's like, ah man, it's really uncomfortable carrying this thing. And you know that cheap gun belt that I bought maybe wasn't built as well as it should have been. And it's starting to sag. It's uncomfortable. It's pulling your pants down. And you need to make a lot of wardrobe considerations if you want to carry a 45, not just for the size, but also for the weight. Yeah, 
Now the first guys who carried 1911s were not trying to hide the fact that they were packing. <laughs> That's right. Our, our GIs in uh, you know in World War One and World War Two, they were you know going into battle and they couldn't open carry as much as they wanted, and you know they had the systems to do that. Whereas if you want to conceal, I mean, admittedly, a 1911 does conceal pretty nice. <laughs> Uh, I'm, just, I'm just picturing the German shoulders, soldiers. Uh, Hans, do you think he is uh, holding it? Is he carrying a pistol? <laughs> I, I don't know. I did not see him printing for it. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I don't think That's they. I don't. German accent. Uh, that was spectacular, Dave. We Thank gotta get, we gotta start up a new YouTube channel for for just accents for you. But uh, we get canceled in like two seconds. Yeah, as soon probably. As I went beyond Germans, there would there would the crowd come. Oh, it would be bad. It would be bad. But yeah, I don't think they were. Our GIs were worried too much in you know Normandy or uh, you know in the hedgerows whether they were printing or not. But when you're out in the concrete jungle, uh, it, it definitely can matter. I mean, if you're concealed carrying, you want to conceal for a reason. Now, as I was alluding to, the 1911 does actually conceal fairly decently, all things considered, because it's so thin. But mm -hmm. it's big, it's long, and when you get down to smaller ones like an officer's 1911 or something like that, you've got to deal with the recoil. Yeah, that's always the trade-off. Shorter barrel, lighter gun, more recoil. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like you were talking about, even, uh, you know, a light, uh, small 9mm will have considerably more recoil than something full-size like this Glock 17. And... It's something you need to train with a lot, and that's something that I always try and emphasize when I'm, you know, writing or whether we're talking here on the podcast is to really enforce. I want everybody to get out to the range and practice, practice with your EDC so that you're proficient and so you know what it's going to feel like when you pull the trigger on that thing. Yeah, yeah. Even your 19, that's a little more than your average Joe wants to slip between his waistband. That's that's uh that's what cops are carrying on their their belt holsters and they too aren't really trying to hide the fact that they're carrying oh absolutely and, and that's uh, another thing that comes to it is you have now the single stack nine millimeters that uh you know are even thinner than you know something big like this 17 that i've got uh you know it really makes that size a lot more comfortable and it gets to the point where some guys even tell me they forget that they're carrying which is exactly where you want to be that's what you want uh, but just make sure that you are, you know, you have yourself a proper belt, a proper holster, and plan your wardrobe accordingly. Uh, you know, we're going to have to leave the the tight shirts at home, sadly. Yeah, I know you're eager to show off your perfect six pack abs, but uh, yeah, that Glock 43. I mean, it has no issues that I wouldn't have in the other ultra compact single stack nine mil. I think that's it's one of the best. Oh, definitely. Uh, We're talking about single stack nine mils. Yeah, definitely. No, there are really some good options out there for you. That uh, it will be a little bit reduced magazine ca capacity, but even then, uh, it's going to be more than if you were having something like a single stack forty-five. Yeah, or even a revolver. I oh think, yeah. Uh, I don't know what's the mag capacity on a Glock forty-three six. So equal. If you want to carry one in the chamber, you can still have another shot than a revolver crowd, but. Uh, no, it's not, it's not a bad option at all. It is, but, I mean, you look at something like the single-stack Glocks, if I'm not mistaken, the, the 45s, they got, what, like a five-round capacity? If I, I can't remember off the top of my head. I'll have to look. Uh, but uh, it you're always going to be able to carry more bullets with a 9mm. That's just all there is to it. And oftentimes, he who brings the most ammunition to the fight usually wins. It's true. That's why you never want to challenge an ammo.com employee. Exactly. We're packing, um, <clears throat> we're packing magazines everywhere here uh, at that home right. base here. We've got a whole warehouse. Oh, absolutely. Now, all the size considerations are the same. And in spite of their very different bullets and how they perform, not dramatically different terminal performance, stopping power, whatever kind of vague term you want to refer to uh, their performance as. Uh, the, 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 the 45 ACP that's got just a little bit heavier than a half ounce bullet. Oh, it's yeah. It's only launching it to a velocity of 830 feet per second. God, I should have memorized these. And there's a lot of variation. There, there's lighter 185 and 165 loads. Whereas the 9 millimeter, its bullet weighs about a quarter of an ounce. And it's uh, breaking a sound barrier quite often. So you're talking about like half as much bullet and 50% more muzzle velocity in very rough turns. 
that's a really good analysis, Dave, and I have to compliment you for having most of that memorized. It's better than what I have off the top of my head. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's one thing about the 45 is it's it's just a bigger bullet. And I think penetration wise, now we're seeing about equal, uh, I would say. A lot of people like to point to, of course, the 1986 uh, Miami shootout is the big, you know, defining moment for the FBI where they're like, let's quantify stopping power as best we can. And they went with the the penetration method for the most part and how it performed in ballistic gel. And uh, of course, back then, nine mil hollow points weren't necessarily as good as they are today. Nowhere near as good. It's, yeah. it's an amazing testament to how much we've improved powder formulation technology. And, uh, and the bullets themselves. I mean, just the, the yeah, expansion ability. Yeah, especially. I mean, we didn't have spear gold dots back then. We mm -hmm. didn't have XTPs. We didn't have all these fancy bonded jackets. Oh, yeah. It was a flimsier bullet back in uh, 800 years ago during 1986. <laughs> it feels like it. Uh, you know, I, I won't reveal my age, but let's just say that, uh, yeah, I wasn't really looking into firearms at that point in my life. Uh, but no, we really have come a long way. And I know that, uh, you know, the 45 crowd out here is going to be like, but dude, it's a bigger bullet. It's going to leave a bigger hole. And you know, you're right. That, that's very yeah. true. Yeah, absolutely. But you got to take, uh, the FMJ into account. So mm. many people don't know this, but national militaries are obligated to use non-expanding projectiles yep. during international yep. warfare mm -hmm. and this is a moratorium set in place by the hague convention many many decades ago yes. so you can't use an fm or a, a jhp mm -hmm. in combat without breaking various laws and and, and getting you know war in crimes trouble. brought yeah. up so the 45 auto since all of its military users had to use fmjs that extra tenth of an inch meant a lot. You were going to bore that much wider a uh, wound channel into your target. But you're not obligated to use non-expanding bullets for self-defense. It's exactly. advisable that you use expanding bullets for self-defense because they actually reduce the chance of dangerous overpenetration that could jeopardize innocent bystanders. And to that end, a good 9mm JHP can easily expand more than 50% its original diameter. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, but I mean, on the flip side there, you'd be like, well, the 45 can expand almost the double that as well. And that's true also. But I think, you know, for the 45 crowd, they're gonna be like, oh, kinetic energy, we've got more kinetic energy. And again, that's true. But the, the big question is, is how much of a role does that really play a part? And is it more about shot placement? Or is it about the energy that you're dumping into the target? And that's a pretty murky issue. Yeah. Well, anyone would say shot placement is the most important part of terminal yep. performance. I mean, you shoot a guy in the toe with a 50 BMG versus right between the eyes with a 22 LR, different outcomes. Oh, definitely. Uh, and, and this is something I like to talk about. Uh, you know, my, my personal favorite is, is a 45 in the hand is less lethal than a 22 between the eyes. Uh, but it, it really does come down to that. And I think a lot of the you know the mystery and the the awe surrounding the 45 definitely does come from those wartime experiences and i, I have to agree with you those bigger bullets are going to make a bigger hole and it's going to be more important in that field but as a civilian for most of us who are, are of course we love our military uh you know viewers as well but for most of us who are allowed to carry jhp ammunition uh it really the divide between the two is significantly smaller when you throw that jacket and hollow point in the mix as opposed to just talking about full metal jackets mm -hmm. yeah i mean for for civilian self-defense ammo they're all getting assessed according to the same fbi test protocol for yeah. penetration depth and expansion reliability so we're basically trying to make all these rounds excel according to the same standards does that does that make sense absolutely yeah we for, want we want it all to perform we, and protect your life if needed yeah basically all these companies they've spent millions and millions and millions of dollars making nine millimeters perform basically on par oh yeah with your 45 acp your, you know all these guys so we kind of perfected you know this would have been a very different conversation back during the 1950s oh very much so. was different when when the actual physical characteristics of the bullet had a much more dramatic impact on uh, terminal ballistics. But now now it really does come down to 
to your preference more than anything else. One really... thing, the 45... Sorry, I interrupted no, you. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. One thing I got to say the 9 mil kind of excels at is uh, longer distance accuracy, which to be sure isn't, isn't as important when you're doing self-defense and the threat is probably going to be five yards away from you. But that lighter, faster bullet is just going to exhibit a flatter trajectory that does make it somewhat easier to, to hit your mark. Absolutely. And this is something that I think is, uh, you know, a bit of a misconception is that everybody thinks that every self-defense situation is going to be within five to 10 yards. And I'll say the vast majority will be, but that doesn't mean that you can't shoot longer ranges with your handgun. And honestly, if you want a fun time, go out to the range and give it a try. Uh, it's really a blast. Honestly, I've got an outdoor range and I love sometimes just backing it up to like 50 and I've got like a big metal plate and just ringing that with the nine millimeter is a really good time. Nice. Now, do you find it's easier with the nine than 45? Absolutely. Uh, I think a lot of that comes down to not only just the trajectory, but the recoil impulse as well. It's, it's just a bit easier to handle that nine millimeter recoil than it is 45. Now I can, I know what the comments are going to be and feel free to leave it for me. So you can prove me right. Be like, Oh, Chris, you just got to man up and, handle that 45 recoil better and there, there's something to be said about that but uh you know <laughs> accuracy is everyone one... attack chris's masculinity in the comments feel so. free i'll you know i've got the man card right here you can go ahead and try and take it from me if you want uh but it, it's one of those things yeah i do find it easier with the nine millimeter than i do with the 45 yeah well Look, most people are going to find that the nine millimeters recoil is a little lighter, and that is a huge bonus when you're when you're defending yourself. It is it, it, not only in follow-up shots, but just in general accuracy as well. I I read a police report that was talking about a lot of different police shootings, and they find that you know accuracy suffers quite a bit uh, when you're in that life or death situation when you've got that adrenaline dump, your heart rate is going at you know 110 miles an hour. Uh, those fine motor skills just go away that you've been practicing at the range and it all comes down to those you know those basic ingrained trainings that you've done and uh, accuracy kind of goes out the window a little bit yeah you know I, you, you love to imagine yourself as some kind of smooth operator but oh yeah like man I, I, you feel that adrenaline coursing through your veins and, and not much else in the moment Oh, definitely. Thank heavens I haven't had to experience that myself personally, but uh, I can only imagine uh, for those that have uh, and how difficult it must have been to make that split-second decision with all of those things going on. Uh, but it, it, it's one of those things that, you know, like you said, we like to think of ourselves as this, you know, bullseye shooter uh, that, you know, you're, you're splitting hairs at 50 yards with a handgun, which uh, is quite a task, uh, even under the most ideal circumstances. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think cops, trained cops, hit the target less than half the time. Yep, absolutely. And that's what a lot of these reports show. And again, it's why I think, honestly, in my opinion, a lot of uh, you know agencies and things like that are switching back to the 9 millimeters because if you think about the math of it, if you can carry more bullets, it means you're going to have more hits on targets, even if your accuracy is only 50%. Mm -hmm. The magic of the mag dump. Absolutely, of course. Uh, bag dumps, of course, fun things to do at the range and often ha happens in a self-defense situation. But, of course, always be aware of your surroundings. Know what your backstop is because the last thing you want to do is hit a innocent bystander in that situation. Yeah, that's, that's going to ruin a lot of people's day. Definitely, definitely. It doesn't matter whether you're shooting 9 or 45 at that point. Um, I wanted to ask you, so obviously the, the 230 grain 45 bullet loaded to a muzzle velocity of 830 fps that's a standard but i really wanted because you're a 45 nut your opinion on these lighter 185 grain loads that aren't made to, to military specs or do they did it make it easier do they lessen recoil do they 
make it more accurate? Are you just going to pile your target with more energy? What's the advantage to kind of uh, stepping outside of the traditional 230 grain range? No, uh, Dave, those 185 grainers are spectacular, if you ask me. Uh, I really love them. I feel that they recoil a little bit less, even though they're typically going a little faster. Uh, I find they shoot a bit flatter. And when you start getting into plus P variations on 45, look out. Uh, that is a monster of a round, and that can do some serious damage. Yeah, those plus P loads are also kind of contentious in the ammo community. I mean, purists just love the classic 45 ACP. Oh, yeah. Is there is there a good advantage, like a worthwhile advantage for going over pressure with 45 ACP? I think, honestly, when you, when you lighten the bullet up and you get down to those 185s or those 200 ranges, I think yes, honestly. Uh, giving that extra bit of uh, power, that extra velocity can really help with barrier penetration, especially for our law enforcement shooters uh, who have to maybe shoot shoot through uh, you know auto glass or things like that uh, for the civilian shooter I wouldn't advise doing that if you can uh, you know avoid it it's definitely there's a bigger liability in that uh, in that range but if you want to have that extra power uh, you know that extra pressure with the 45 I I like it honestly it, it's pretty nasty and uh, a lot of people like uh, plus P in their nine millimeters yeah it's an interesting thing you pointed out police grade ammunition is always designed to to penetrate auto glass, mm -hmm. which is even uh, harsher on a bullet than than like sheet metal. Yeah. So, but but you as a civilian, very unlikely you're going to have to shoot through auto glass and car doors. So uh, you can get away with slightly cheaper ammo than like Federal HST or Spear Gold Dot. That's still the best kind of stuff you can get. Oh yeah. But uh, like for instance, Federal a couple of years ago introduced their punch line of ammunition, mm -hmm. which is cheaper but also not designed to, to dominate those really resilient urban barriers that cops have to deal with on so frequent a basis yeah absolutely i'm glad that we have access to that because you know the second amendment is pretty clear that we should have access to that sort of ammunition but uh for most self-defense situations it's a bit much i mean like i said if if i'm shooting into auto glass there's a big problem uh at, yeah. at that point uh and <laughs> Uh, but for the most part, you know, uh, any type of home defense situation, uh, you know, self-defense in the concrete jungle, as I like to say, you're not going to need to overcome those barriers for the most part. And something a little bit less expensive, but just as effective, like those federal punch ammo, it's definitely a cost-saving measure. And that lets you practice with your carry ammo, which is incredibly important. Yeah, that's huge. It's extremely expensive to yeah. uh, to, to train with with top shelf self-defense ammo if you can great but ideally you would always train with what do they say train how you fight absolutely and you know i think that it's it's worth it i understand especially now with how you know ammo prices have gone uh but of course make sure you're getting your 20 dollars off coupon don't forget about that uh but i i like to always try and finish off at least five or six rounds of my self-defense ammo i know it's expensive but it really helps make sure that you have that feeling ingrained so there's not a surprise because let's be honest uh you know practice grade fmj ammo is is loaded pretty light yeah yeah like your winchester usa 115 grain fmjs oh yeah <laughs> yeah it ain't like that when you're uh when you're firing the 124 grain plus p's oh yeah definitely a huge difference not only in recoil but just a bit of the snap that you feel when that when you crack those off it's definitely a different feeling and as a hand loader i can tell you i load my nine millimeters pretty soft yeah just your target range stuff oh yeah absolutely uh my competition ammo things like that uh yeah, I load those about as light as I can legally do it for competition. And uh, it's definitely different when you're firing full power, uh, you know, 9 mil or even 45. There's quite a difference. So make sure you practice. Practice like you fight, like you said earlier. We usually touch on ammo availability. Mm -hmm. Like if we're comparing a niche cartridge to a more mainstream one, we always want to point out, like, maybe go with the more mainstream one just so you can get a better deal on, on ample supplies of ammo. No problem here. These rounds are two such popular rounds that you're going to find either one at any store you go into. Oh, definitely. There's not much more mainstream than the 9mm or the 45, if you ask me. These are America's favorite cartridges at this point. I think the 9mm is one of the most popular handgun cartridges out there uh, at this point, if not the number one selling uh, handgun. Yeah, it's uh, the number one in the world. That's what I thought. The, 
it's the standard uh, for all our branches of the U.S. Army. I know mm -hmm. Beretta just got their their nine millimeter gun standardized for the U.S. Army. So oh, it was constant Sig. supply assured. Sig. It was the Sig. Yeah, it was the Sig P three twenty. Moved on from Beretta lost. Correct. It, right? Yes, Beretta lost it. The M nine's out. And the Sig is in. Uh, but but uh, uh, yeah, it's just a, a constant torrent of nine millimeters always going to be available. I don't know if if any are there any standard issue uh, forty five ACP firearms still issued, or, or just uh, you know traditionalists who want nineteen elevens maybe. I think there are a few, if I recall, and someone can correct me down in the comments if I'm wrong, but I thought there were a few special units in the Marines that still had 1911s issued to them. Uh, as far as a double stack 1911, like a SIG, or uh, even a single stack, like a SIG P220, I don't know of any that are units that are using it offhand. Of course, the Spec Ops guys get to use whatever they want, uh, and, but I don't think that's really a fair comparison because that's a pretty niche group of operators, to say the least. But as far as mainstream use of the 45 in the military, I think it's pretty much all 9mm at this point. So basically, yeah, it's the commercial market is serving the 45 ACP crowd, but that's such a big crowd that you're assured oh, yeah. a constant supply of 45 as well. I mean, it's it's America's cartridge. Let's be honest. I mean, it was the war horse. All right. I mean, World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam. Uh, it did it through all of those. Uh, and it, the 1911 is a classic American design. It is American firearms, in my opinion. And it's something that's not going anywhere. I mean, it's over a century old at this point, and it's still. I don't know if I'd say as popular, but pretty darn close as it was back in the 50s. Yeah, you know, I heard a guy once say they call us boomers because that's the sound our ammo makes. <laughs> I like I, that. I think I think the average 45 fan is a little older than your average nine millimeter fan. I would say so, but uh, you know, I have to put myself in the 45 crew as well, so I don't think you can call me that old. But uh, I think I would classify as a boomer. I don't know. Uh, I'm not up on these. I think new... in terms of sensibilities and agility, you might classify as a boomer. But fair enough. Techni technically. I don't know. Fair you enough. You look like you're part of the silent generation, Chris. Exactly. That's it. Except I'm talking on here all the time, so I'm not all that silent. But uh, but no, I, I have to agree. You know, 45 fans definitely maybe a little bit older, but, uh, you know, you get one of these classic firearms in somebody's hands, and they fall in love with it really quick. I remember I was teaching, uh, you know, a, a lady friend of mine to shoot, and uh, she gravitated to the 1911 immediately and actually picked one up herself cool so that's her carry yeah, absolutely and you know i think that's really what it comes down to uh you know between picking the two you know if we kind of want to bring this you know closer towards the end it, it's it's not so much about the terminal ballistics it's not about the numbers the magazine capacity it's shoot what you love and shoot a lot honestly there is a lot to be said about american pride as far yeah. as your cartridge is designed uh I know it's not necessarily going to provide any tactical advantages to know that John Moses Browning designed your, your handgun, but uh, hard to feel any affinity for, for a round that was designed by an Austrian guy in 1901. Fair enough. Hey, you know, everybody's got their opinion as far as that's concerned. And, you know, not even, not just the ammo, but the firearm as well. Of course, the Glock, uh, you know, one of the more popular semi-autos out here, of course, is built in Austria for the most part. Uh, but, you know, it, there is definitely a part of national pride into in the 45. I think that's why it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, and it, it's going to remain one of the most popular center fire handgun cartridges. Of course, the 9 mil is going to be, you know, reigning supreme for quite some time. But, uh, you know, 45 isn't going anywhere either. Yeah. So, gosh, we always tell people to pick whichever one they prefer. That's kind of a weaselly answer. Um, in this case, I'd say at least have a 9 millimeter handgun as backup. So if things ever really go south, mm -hmm. you know, me and Chris, we're not tinfoil hatted preppers over here, but you should always be able to, to get some ammo, no matter how bad things get. At least have a 19 millimeter firearm, a 9 millimeter firearm, just so you can have the best chance of being able to get ammo during STHF 
types of situations. Absolutely. You know, and let's even bring it back a little bit. Of course, there is the big ammo shortage back, uh, you know, a couple years ago. And, yeah. uh, you know, sometimes these more difficult cartridges were more difficult to get a hold of. Imagine that. Mm-hmm. But 9mm was still around. Uh, even at least some FMJs, you could find some FMJs on the shelf. Uh, and uh, it definitely, there definitely is a lot of credence to that, Dave, uh, you know, having the ability to utilize that ammunition so you're not just, you know, throwing your firearm at them. Now, that being said, if you do need to throw a firearm at somebody, and it's all steel 1911 is an excellent choice, though I would use it as a club first before I would use it as a rock. Well, here's some here's some tactical advice for you. <laughs> you know, it just it hits harder than this polymer frame thing right here. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, but you know, having having that cross caliber, uh, you know, ability is really helpful. Like you said, in case ammunition gets you know short, it gets hard to find. Having that ability to still be able to get out of the range and keep training, even if it is with a nine millimeter, and you're just a 45 lover at least you're getting out and you're practicing your marksmanship skills. And that's really what's important uh, is to be as proficient as possible with your firearm of choice and, uh, you know, go with it. Uh, Just embrace it, but be able to shoot both. It's a really useful thing, and they're both going to be very popular here in the United States, to say the least. i got to throw one more thing out there for the very new to ammo types of listeners. All right. Do not buy 9mm Makarov. Oh, gosh, yes. We have had that happen before. People are excited to get their their new ammo, and they, they ordered 9mm Makarov. And yes. Holy cow. Yeah, so that is one of the, the sad naming conventions that will definitely trip people up. And as myself as a reloader, I, of course, hate finding Makarov brass uh, stuck in my 9mm Luger brass. But yeah, uh, 9mm Makarov, completely separate cartridge. Uh, if memory serves, the 9mm is 9 by 19 and Makarov is 9 by 18 uh, so, The Russians specifically designed the 9mm mm-hmm. Makarov to not work yep. with 9mm Luger handguns. Exactly. So in case of a conflict, like during it, what would, people were preparing for in the Cold War, uh, we couldn't pick their ammunition off of them. Yeah, it would have been useless to us, and vice versa. Yep. So, yeah, make sure you know what your firearm is chambered in. And just because it says 9mm in front doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right 9mm. Make sure you're checking. But I will say 9mm, 9mm Luger, 9mm Parabellum, or 9x19 is all the same thing. 9mm Makarov is something completely different. And I meant to ask, I, I can chamber 4570 government in my 45 ACP handgun, right? Sadly, no. Uh, no, that is a rifle round. And man, if you get if you jam a 4570 into your 1911, you're going to have more problems than uh, you know the thing not chambering. It would just be impressive if you managed. True. Uh, I mean, it would take up probably about half of the barrel, if I'm not mistaken. But. Uh, that's going to be a bad day, yeah. Uh, and there are a lot of different 45s out there. There's 45 Colt that will not fit in, in a 45 ACP. Uh, you, you mentioned the 4570; those are probably the two most popular. Uh, oh, and then 45 a, Gap. I was that's about you. On to you, people. you took the words right out of my mouth. Yes, the 45 Gap, and then uh, there's also the 460 Roland that runs around uh, that can get mixed into your brass. Boy, but that one's pretty rare now. It is. It, it's very true. But yeah, the 45 Gap also is starting to kind of fade into the annals of history, and I'm I'm kind of okay with that as a reloader. Yeah. Yeah, folks, we'll never do a podcast on a 45 Gap. Yeah, we're gonna leave that one. We're gonna let that one die, and I'm okay with it. Huh. All right. I don't know how much more we could summarize this one. I mean, get both and fire them a lot. Go to ammo.com to buy ammo. Absolutely. Click that link down in the description. If you haven't done so already, click that like and subscribe button. It really helps the channel grow. And yeah, get out there, get to the range, flex those 2A rights, and we'll see you on the next one. <laughs>